Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Myopia Podcast. Today, we're joined by Dr. Jeff Walling. We're going to be speaking about atropine, why it needs to be part of your myopia protocol, concentrations, side effects, and how to get started on the Myopia Podcast. Optometric Insights Media proudly presents the Myopia Podcast, where we give you the latest myopia research, clinical topics, and industry insights. Make sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all of our awesome myopia content. And now to our host, a massive myopia manager himself, Dr. David Kading. Well, thank you for joining us for this episode of the Myopia Podcast. We're joined once again by, by uh, Dr. Jeff Walleen. And as many of you know, he's at The Ohio State University. Uh, Jeff and I have, um, have known each other for quite a while, but I've always looked up to Jeff for his work and how he makes uh, his research so clinically relevant, all the way dating back to some of the early days with Achieve, some of the early days with the uh, with his orthokeratology and his gas permeable research. It's been really a joy and a pleasure to apply your research into my clinical practice. Thank you for joining us today, Jeff. Well, and thank you for, you know, pro you know providing these research results for practitioners because it's important. If, if we can prov provide all the results, but if they don't get to practitioners, they don't mean anything. So thank you. True. That's true. Well, it's absolutely my pleasure. So the intention of the Myopia podcast is to really talk about the different avenues and methods that can be used for myopia management. And, uh, you know, one of the, one of the things that we don't see a, a lot of, a lot of research coming out on is atropine. And I think the reason why is because there's not any major pharmaceutical vendors that are putting tons and tons of money in that. Now, that being said, there are some, and we're going to continue to see some products becoming available. Um, but historically we haven't seen a lot. We've got some great studies, which I'm going to have you briefly talk about the Adam studies and the lamp study being the ones that I think of uh, and most people are thinking of. Can you share with us a little bit about atropine and, you know, as far as you understand how it came to be in this myopia arena and, uh, you know, how it's been used historically, and then we'll talk later about how it's being used now. Sure. You know, I, I think atropine, the idea of atropine originally was that it would reduce accommodative effort. Um, and accommodative effort was what was thought to be one of the causes of myopia. So, but basically over time, it was found that atropine works not through accommodation, but through the anti-muscarinic or the muscarinic receptors that are primarily in the retina. Beyond that, we really don't know what the downstream effects are. If it's, you know, an increase in dopamine caused by this, or if it's an increase in scleral rigidity that slows the growth of the eye, we really mm -hmm. don't have the answers to that yet. But the original idea was because it would reduce accommodation. Um, and that was with 1% um, atropine, but then subsequent studies found that lower concentrations without those significant side effects could actually slow eye growth and or myopia progression. And that's where we are at today. Mm -hmm. What, uh, as, as, as we look back and, and you know far more of the research than I do, but um, these, this ADAM study and the ADAM2 and the LAMP study, can you briefly summarize the, the clinically relevant data that we learned from those studies uh, over the last well, seven years or so since they were published. Sure, absolutely. I mean, the Adam one study was with 1% atropine mm -hmm. and they randomly assigned eyes to atropine and found that it had a very meaningful, very profound effect on both myopia progression and eye growth over a two year period. Yeah. Um, they subsequently wanted to find out what's the lowest concentration that they could use and still get meaningful slowing of eye growth and, and myopia progression. So they compared half percent to 0.1%. And then their control group actually was 0.01% because, you know, at that time, we all believe that 0.01% would never have a high enough concentration to have a meaningful effect. But when they basically compared those results with the 0.01% atropine as the control group to the placebo control group in that 1% atropine study, the ADAM1 study, they found that it slowed myopia progression by about 60%. Um, 
And so that was, you know, one idea that, hey, these lower concentrations can work. So it was from that that the LAMP study ultimately happened by a different group where they wanted to find out what's the best low concentration atropine that works. So they compared 0.01% to 0.025 to 0.05. And they found a dose response, basically, that 0.05 worked best. Um, and it did so without additional side effects. So I think they studied it in a really creative and clinically meaningful way. They told these kids on these various atropine concentrations of atropine, they said, if you have problems with bright lights, let us know. Because originally they just gave them single vision clear lenses. If the kids complained to bright lights, they gave them photochromic lenses. They also told them, if you experience near blur, tell us, we'll give you a progressive addition lenses. What they found was that 30% of the kids on 0.05% atropine complained of, of, of bright lights, so they gave them photochromic lenses, which sounds significant, but 40% of the control group wanted photochromic lenses. So that ultimately tells us that kids are photophobic in general, but atropine doesn't make them more photophobic. Mm -hmm. And then almost none of the kids said they had blurry vision at near. So Ultimately, what that tells us is 0.05% atropine provides meaningful slowing of myopia progression, and it, per, it does it without additional side effects. But the important point to take away is that 0.01% atropine slows myopia progression without slowing eye growth. 0.05% atropine slows myopia progression, and it does a better job of slowing eye growth. So yeah. My recommendation is to use 0.05% atropine if using it for myopia control. Right. So, you know, you may see a prescription uh, progression reduction, so mm -hmm. to speak, with the 0.01%. But uh, the concern with myopia management is eyeball elongation. And so really what we're trying to do is not just stop a prescription because we can always give somebody a higher prescription we're trying to stop the eye progression leading to disease, which is presumed to be because of this eyeball elongation. Exactly. Did I summarize that correctly? Absolutely. Yeah. You know, they yeah. should be connected, but for some reason, mm -hmm. and that's, that's the other reason that I recommend 0.05 versus 0.01 is because I don't know how 0.01 is slowing myopia progression if it doesn't slow eye growth. So, you know, 0.05, I can explain a little bit better. Yeah. One of the other things that I, I think I picked up from the Adam studies is, um, is the cessation of the atropine and the rebound effect. Can you talk a little bit about how that can become clinically relevant for us? Absolutely. So if you give kids treatment for two years and then you take them off treatment, if they're on the high concentration atropine, 1% atropine, they will quickly become more myopic versus if you put them on 0.01% atropine for two years and then take them off, they really continue at the same rate. So ultimately, after two years on atropine and one year off, the best myopia control is with 0.01% atropine, even better than you know, um, 1% atropine. Mm -hmm. And the reason that, you know, 1% atropine probably has this rebound effect is it works significantly by reducing accommodative, you know, the, the ciliary tonus. And so when you do that, you actually reduce re myopic refractive error because you're um, making the lens less powerful. And you also um, get shorter axial length. And you can see that in those studies with the high concentrations of atropine, you actually get eye shortening and lower refractive error over just a one month period. Whereas you don't get that with 0.01, and that tells us it's unlikely to rebound like 1% atropine does. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's yet another reason to suggest people use low concentration atropine. And we, don't, we haven't seen the total results from the LAMP study because they actually switched all their control group to uh, 0.05% atropine, I believe. And so we won't see, you know, that compared to placebo, but it, it right. unlikely to get rebound effect. Now there's this, there's th this other aspect of this that I have heard people talk about and that is, well, of course they rebounded. 
uh, you should never take a person off atropine suddenly. Um, is the school of thought that you subscribe to that uh, just like we would never take somebody off of steroids uh, quickly, that atropine shouldn't be removed quickly either, particularly at a higher concentration? And is that the reason why the rebound happened? If you had done a 1% over a three-month period and, and, and tapered it down, would would we have seen the same effect? I don't know that we fully know that, but what what are your thoughts? My personal thoughts are there's absolutely no reason to believe that tapering does anything. Um, and the reason I say that is the reason you get the rebound effect with 1% atropine is because you're reducing ciliary tonus when you first, impl first implement the treatment. Um, you don't lose that with lower concentrations. Um, so there isn't, we aren't expected to rebound and we actually don't get rebound with those lower concentrations. So I really don't see the reason for tapering. There's absolutely no evidence to show whether tapering does has any effect at all. Um, so why do it um, is mm -hmm. my sort of takeaway. Yeah. Well, we've, we've got continued research coming out with, with regards to atropine and, and you were sharing with me that you guys have uh, had some work at the Ohio State on this and one of your master's students can share a little bit about safety and uh, what you guys have learned uh, about atropine and um, how it's backed up by what we've, what we've already learned. Yeah, Ben Cyphers just finished his master's thesis and we've already submitted it for publication. But he looked at just over a one week period of giving 0.01% uh, atropine to optometry students. What's the effects on accommodation, on you know, reading speed, on intraocular pressure? And basically, he found no significant differences and certainly no clinically meaningful differences from before giving them these atropine eye drops to after where he did see one statistically significant but maybe not clinically meaningful difference was intraocular pressure increased by a, a millimeter and a half of mercury in the right eye and about three quarters of a millimeter of mercury in the left. So I'd say, you know, about one millimeter of mercury. Right. Um, that may be because you've, you get more of a mid dilated pupil it could be, you know, rest restricting a little bit the, the outflow that you get from through the trabecular meshwork. Um, mm -hmm. But you have to decide if that's really important for you. I've been traditionally recommending that people measure IOP on follow-up. I'm not even certain that that's really necessary um, because it's yeah. really not that much of an increase. Um, yeah. But otherwise, he found you know no meaningful um, changes with atropine. But one of the cool things he did was he actually um, had people judge how comfortable the drop was when it was in instilled. Hmm. So... Um, and he compared it with artificial tears and uh, propericane. And what he found was that immediately, right after you put in the eye drops, of course, artificial tears is the most comfortable and propericane is the least comfortable and atropine's right in between there. Um, after five seconds, it turns out that there was um, no significant difference between propericane and atropine, but artificial tears was more comfortable than the other two. And then at the end of 10 seconds, he found that atropine actually was the least comfortable, followed by propericane, followed by artificial tears. But the, the average was three out of 10 in terms of where one is um, no discomfort and 10 is extremely uncomfortable. Mm. So I think mm -hmm. the, for clinicians, the important takeaway message is this doesn't hurt worse than propericane um, when you first put it in the eye. And... Um, it's really not an uncomfortable drop for most people. There was one person who rated it as seven, both before and after taking drops for a week. Um, and, you know, we don't know if that's a dramatic person, you know, just <laughs> same amount of pain, but they yeah. rate it worse. Or if it's because, you know, maybe they had an allergy to the, to the right. preservatives yeah. or maybe their P their, the pH of their eye is different. And so it's affected more. Um, we want to look into that more. But the, the other thing that he found out was that the pain continued to increase through 10 seconds. And we don't, we didn't measure it beyond 10 seconds. So we don't know. So we're yeah. going to look at that in the future. Yeah. So just for, for, for listeners, you know, atropine can be uh, obtained through 
uh, a, a local compounding pharmacy. I think that's where a lot of clinicians are getting it. You can uh, just r- call up to a, a pharmacy and say, hey, or, you know, look for compounding pharmacies in your area and reach out to them and say, could you make this for me? And then designate the, uh, the, the, the concentration that you want and then have the patient go and reach out to them. Oh, with our local pharmacy, that's how we've done it and have had a good relationship with them. There are some products that are available, and I, I, I don't know if you want to speak to them that are coming available, um, that, uh, that you can get the prescriptions made up and sent to the patient from a kind of a universal pharmacy that can send it around the country. So just be on the lookout for those in the trade journals. They're already available and coming available as well in the near future. And I know that eye drops are going to be a major part of myopia management in the future. Jeff, can you share with us uh, about other eye drops that we may be thinking of in the future? Or is there being, is there research being done right now by some of the pharmaceuticals that you're aware of uh, that are going to be, we should be keeping our eye out for? The only one that I really know of is 7-methylxanthine, um, which is yep. a caffeine derivative. Um, mm-hmm. But if that were, you know, if that were effective, then I would be a hyperope. Um, no, I'm just <laughs> kidding. Um, uh, I, I don't know. From the studies that I've seen, I'm not sure about the eff- effectivity of that ultimately, but it, it remains to be seen. Um, that's the only one, honestly, that I really know about. Um, yeah. So I'm not privy to some of the others. And, and I think that's a good drop for parents to give their children right before they go to bed at <laughs> night. Uh, exactly. It's, it's a good way to go. <laughs> right. Absolutely. Well, hey, I wanted to pick your brain about another topic, and that relates to axial length and uh, versus, um, versus uh, a refraction, cycloplegic, uh, auto refraction, or what not to measure myopia management. And I loved the, uh, the breakout actually it wasn't a breakout. It was a major, it was a full session at GSLS. I think it was two years ago where you played the devil's advocate and you did a phenomenal job, uh, playing the devil's advocate, arguing every side of the issue up and down, calling people bozos for the way they were thinking about any one thing. It was extremely entertaining and very enlightening. But one of the arguments that I hear quite frequently by, uh, by people in the myopia management space is you must have something to measure axial length if you're going to do myopia management. Uh, otherwise, you don't know if they're progressing. And, um, you know, I, I think you and I have similar perspectives on this. Axial length is an incredible tool to add to your toolbox. Uh, but Does that mean you must have an OCT if you're going to measure glaucoma? Well, you must have uh, a topographer if you're going to fit a scleral contact lens. You know, is this one of those things where it's it's a have to or is it a luxury item in your mind? uh, Honestly, in my mind, it's a luxury item. I think you can get some additional information on occasional patients, Um, but I, I would never let the lack of a biometer keep me from doing myopia control. I just don't think it's necessary. Um, You know, you can, even if you're doing orthokeratology, you can still sort of monitor myopia progression by looking at the changes you make in the base curve of the contact lens. Um, And, and knowing that when you flatten the base curve, you're making a, a change in terms of the patient's myopia. So, you know, even with orthokeratology, I think you can still monitor myopia progression without measuring axial length. But it, like, like you said, it can provide additional information by which you can make decisions. So, you know, if you're doing a lot of myopia control, you might consider, um, you know, uh, getting a a biometer of some sort that will help measure and provide you with additional information. But, but absolutely, you can do myopia control without a biometer. Don't let that hold you back. Right. Speak to us a little bit about uh, clinically relevant refractive data. Um, is your perspective that we need to put, uh, I'm being facetious here, a drop of atropine and wait a week and check the refraction? Or is it something where we can use cyclopenylate or tropicamide or uh, autorefractor? Or can we just do manifest refractions on kids and 
say that that's it. Say a kid is doing atropine or is doing, uh, you know, soft multifocals, taking ortho care out of this. Um, what, what are your kind of thoughts, you know, clinically um, as opposed to research? Yeah. Um, like, yeah, like you said, for research, I think it needs to be cycloplegic auto refraction 100%. But for clinical reasons, you know, I think we can follow our myopes with non-cycloplegic manifest refraction. It's something that we need to perform to get you know, our, the best idea of what we want to prescribe for a particular child. So it's something we mm -hmm. measure routinely. And with these young myopes, they're, it's rare when they would be, you know, a pseudo myope or, an, you know, that have some sort of accommodative spasm or something like that. And there are lots of other signs that you can follow to rule those things out. Um, so I really think that the young myopes, I think first time you examine any child, they have to be cycloplegic. If they are my, if they become myopic, you need to cycloplegia them. After that, you can follow it without necessarily doing cycloplegic refractions. You, of course, need to dilate the eyes to make sure they're healthy. But I don't think cycloplegic refractions for myopic children are that necessary afterwards. Mm -hmm. I agree with you. You know, we, um, you may or may not know this, but my wife is a, a binocular vision specialist, and we have a vision therapy clinic in the practice. And uh, my associate was doing a lot of myopia management in vision therapy. And I was quite upset with her. I'm like, why are we not doing, you know, myopia management on these children? And she said, we are. Uh, they have got accommodative problems that are leading towards. And I said, this, I don't understand. So we had two residents who got together and they taught the, uh, you know, the, the leading experts in the, in the field that we need to be thinking about other forms of myopia management. And that really led us to the initial, um, you know, when we get a patient referred, we would oftentimes just look at their refractive error and their topography and decide whether we were going to treat them or not. And, and now, as I think most clinicians should, doing a cycloplegic is obviously an ideal way to go. The most ideal would be a cyclopenolate, but clinically that can be a little difficult if you're got it going this half hour, 45 minutes. And the reason we're doing this drop on our patients is one, to get an accurate refractive error, but two, to find out if there is an accommodative component to the child's progression. And the way we quickly tease that out, because I'm not a BV specialist, but my wife is, is if they're seeing me is I do a refraction on them. And if their cycloplegic refraction is nearly the same, then I'm not blaming accommodation as to the cause. But if there is a change, and we also do a quick binocular vision screener, which you know is an, another episode, but a quick binocular vision screener to find out if there are some components there that we need to refer over to the other uh, other department. So just for you clinicians, uh, you know, utilizing a tropicamide in 15 minutes later, there's uh, some studies on full cycloplegic effect. Not as good as cyclopenolate, but clinically, it's going to make it's going to provide you something which is uh, good enough. If you're not doing anything, start there uh, would be a good way to go. Jeff, I don't know what you have to say about this whole binocular vision component and and so forth, but in 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 your analysis of all of this, it certainly has come up. No, I I completely agree, and I I do think that tropicamide is enough of a cycloplegic agent for your young myopes. It might not be for those hyperopes, and especially if you want to look for latent hyperopia. Um, but I think for our young myopes to follow them over time, absolutely mm -hmm. um, strong enough. Mm -hmm. um, I don't see much of a role for BV or accommodation in terms of myopia progression. Um, uh, there's just been there's been several studies that have looked, and I'll give you one example. The Comet study with progressive addition lens spectacles, yes, found that they worked best for kids with um, esophoria and accommodative lag. Mm -hmm. But then they did a three year follow up study of only kids with esophoria and accommodative lag, and found no greater treatment effect. It was less than a quarter of a diopter over three years. Mm -hmm. So that to me says that even in that group who we expected it to work the best, bifocal glasses still don't work well. So I don't think it was the binocular vision that was leading to the, the myopia progression. Um, yeah. And so, you know, I, I, I think it's more related to the optics of the eye and some of those things. But I'm not saying that, A, they're not important for children because they are extremely 
extremely important for children. And I'm also not saying that they shouldn't be monitored with myopia control because myopia control, the treatment itself can affect those things. Yeah, and so we need absolutely. to monitor it and make sure that, our, that we're not harming the children along the way. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, just to, just to circle back to that, I think that's a, an important component. If you do discover in your myopia ma management analysis an accommodative issue, uh, uh, my recommendation is get the accommodative issue solved in conjunction with or prior to a myopia management, because you may not be accurately measuring the amount of myopia that that child has maybe be calling for a minus two to get them to 2020 where really they need a minus one and go, sending them to some vision therapy or some binocular vision consult is a, is a good entry into the treatment. And that's how we do it in our office is after they've got some binocular vision issues, then they come back into our clinic. Um, we don't, recommend soft multifocals for those people if the binocular vision is their problem uh, for a, or accommodative issue is their problem. We'll start with the binocular vision treatment and vision therapy and then move over to a North OK or a soft multifocal once the accommodation is sound. But we can't forget about those accommodative issues in children as well. So I think you said it very, very well. So thank you for, for that. Well, awesome. Well, uh, I, I, I think we probably should let you go. You've been uh, very, very helpful. Uh, Jeff, it's always a pleasure to uh, apply your science to our clinical practice. My residents uh, are really appreciative of it and, and all the people that I lecture to using your data. So uh, thank you for helping my lecture career be successful because of all your research that you've done. Well, That's thanks for awesome. translating it for the <laughs> practitioners. I do appreciate that as well. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, hey, thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Myopia Podcast. We hope to hear from you and uh, you can leave comments in the section below. And Jeff, again, thank you for joining us today. Thank you. This podcast was brought to you by Optometric Insights Media. If you enjoy our content, please leave a five-star review. And don't forget to subscribe for more great episodes.